We're about to hear three presentations on Steve's contributions to asset pricing, capital markets, and uh, Phil Divick is going to be the first presenter. Thank you so much. Um, John Cox got me thinking I'm in the 40-year club, too. Uh, I met uh, Steve on April 14, 1976. And I was an undergraduate at Indiana University. And uh, I had uh, offers to go to get a PhD either at Rochester or at Penn with, with, with fellowship support. And Steve came to give a seminar. It was the day before I had to decide, which is April 15th. That's why I know the exact date. <laughs> and, uh, and I borrowed an ID to go to beer with the speaker with Steve. I was underage. It was a photo ID. My buddy was like this much shorter than me, had facial hair, I didn't, uh, blue eyes instead of uh, green, um, and, and uh, we looked nothing like each other. And the girl was like, finally let me in. And then we, we were at Nick's Pub in Bloomington, and we're sitting next to a wall, a table that's next to the wall. And Steve sat at the end of the table. I sat next to him, and all the faculty members were over here. <laughs> so I monopolized Steve and talked with him. And as, as always, he was extremely charming. And, and uh, by the end of our discussion, he had agreed to work with me. And the, the nice, one of the great things about Steve is that when he makes, he's great to his students. Once you're identified as his student, I mean, he told me once, he says, if your advisor doesn't stand up for you, who will? And he said nice things about us, even when we didn't deserve it. He was always nice to us. And the following year, when he moved to Yale, after, I'd, you know, after my first year of graduate school, if I hadn't met him then, then uh, uh, there's no way that I would have had the opportunity to move with him up to, up to uh, Yale. But given that he had promised that I could work with him, he felt that he had, you know, an absolute commitment to me. And, and uh, so uh, if you ask me what would my life have been without that, that meeting and that opportunity, I have no idea. You may as well ask me uh, what would my life have been like if I'd never learned to read. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, like, it's like it's so much, he was so much of, of my life and so much of my career it's just impossible to, to imagine. And he was, he was so nice to me and, and so generous. So uh, the last time I saw him was at a dinner uh, in a small group in, uh, at the meetings. And there were six of us at the dinner. And at the end of the dinner, uh, uh, you know, uh, one person was paying for these two and one was paying for these two. And Steve and I were paying for ourselves, and we put, put the credit cards in. And I said, this is the first time this is a watershed event, but I spoke too soon. It was like the first time I managed to pay for my own meal when Steve was here. <laughs> and ever since graduate school, whatever, he always figured out a way to pay for it. And I'd never been able to stop him. And finally, I was going to get to pay for it. And he said, you know, you know, it'll be a lot easier for the waiter to divide by three. He took my credit card out and threw it at me. <laughs> and so I should have just kept quiet. I would have had a chance to do uh, what I've been hoping to do for many years. Uh, but anyway, he's, he was just so nice and so generous to, to all his students. And, you know, all, you know I, I don't have to tell you all the other things that you've already heard from other people about, about how great he is as a mentor and as a teacher. So um, I'm going to talk about, there he is. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, Steve's uh, papers in the area of the term structure of interest rate. He's done so many things. He worked on all these different areas. And uh, uh, a lot of seminal papers. You've heard about some of them. I mean, I was just thinking last night, like, like uh, Roland Ross and Chen Roland Ross were the two, first two Fama French papers before Fama French. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's not, they're not even up there. They're great papers, too. Uh, There's just so much stuff. So here are the term structure papers I found. I'm probably missing some because, I don't know. 
I, I, I'm, I, I suspect I may have read more of Steve's papers than anybody else, but it's a daunting task to even guy, kind of read all of them, let alone, let, let alone go beyond that. Uh, but anyway, these are the papers. So uh, one thing that I heard about the Cox and Saul Ross model in that paper is that uh, one of the authors is an expert on the time value of money, but does not really appreciate the time value of information. <laughs> Why do you think I'm looking at you? <laughs> and so we would go to the mail every day and, and Steve would say, uh, I wonder if John sent us the original of our paper yet. Now, you have to, to, to know, those of you who are uh, young to the profession, that in that day when we said cut and paste, it really meant cut and paste. And there was an actual original copy of the paper, which was on paper, and you know they cut out paragraphs to insert a paragraph and paste them on a paper. So it was, it was a big deal, actually, to try to, try to get it uh, going again. But uh, my understanding is that this paper was accepted at a Econometrica for, I don't know, 10 years or something. And John uh, kept uh, only eight years. Well, <laughs> well Steve appreciated how, how wine improved with age. <laughs> he, he just didn't realize that that applies to papers as well. Yeah. So, so some, sometimes you age wine in the cask. Sometimes you age papers in the journal. <laughs> But anyway, anyway, that's true. So, so anyhow, these are these are absolutely brilliant papers. Actually, the 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 the, the biggest question in my mind is why am I giving this talk and not you two? <laughs> but anyway, I will proceed. Um, so, uh, the Coxer Saul Ross paper uh, was the first one, and 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 you know you have to talk about the risk-neutral pricing, too, because that's, that was a tool that was important, I think, in developing this paper. Um, there used to be just one paper, the, the second one, which talked about the, the term structure of interest rates. I have somewhere in a file a copy of a paper which, is, uh, had, which, which John just told me that he presented at MIT, which had John Cox and Steve Ross in parentheses because, and it had a footnote that says, they're full co-authors, but they haven't seen any draft of the paper yet. <laughs> and so they're not responsible for any mistakes in the paper. And that was like a normal, uh, sensible paper. It said, you know, suppose the interest rate follows this process and the risk premium follows this process, and we have this pricing equation, and then we get, uh, this formula for pricing the bonds and this formula for pricing the bond option. Uh, but at that time, it was, it was, it was, uh, there was a problem that we had in the profession, which is that, that when you write down a model, you didn't know whether or not there was arbitrage. And the story that I heard is that John Cox had written down some examples that looked like perfectly fine interest rate models, term structure models, but that, uh, but they had arbitrage, and it was a problem. And well, actually, uh, it's not true. Uh, probably, probably John Ingersoll. <laughs> See, I told you. I, 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 as I say, I don't know why they're not presenting this, but I'm presenting it so I can make up my own stories if I have to. <laughs> well, that's true. That could be why. Well, you fight with me anyhow. It's okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm used to Jonathan. I can handle you too. Hey, don't don't fight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, that's better. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, uh, the whole reason for the first paper was that if you have an equilibrium model, then uh, it has to be a model where you. Uh, if an agents prefer more to less, then there can't be arbitrage. It has to be a, a viable model. And even that was a little awkward because at the time, the tools for proving optimality using Fleming, Rochelle, and so forth uh, 
uh, weren't well enough developed for, the, for our models. But at least it was a good indication that probably the model was OK. Uh, but anyhow, that's, that's what I know about this, this paper. Uh, uh, John Cox probably doesn't know that, that uh, the other John and Steve used to joke about uh, going and kidnapping your son and holding him ransom for the, <laughs> for the original of the paper. <laughs> but I don't think they really meant it. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, that's a great paper, I'll t a great pair of papers. I'll talk about that. Uh, the third paper is a paper that looks at duration, and particularly Macaulay duration. And it's a very practical paper looking at, um, looking at uh, uh, what are the shortcomings of Macaulay duration, which implicitly, so there are two forms of it. One is the one where you use the discount factor. One is the one where you use the bond's own yield. And the one with the discount factor implicitly assumes parallel changes in the yield curve, which actually implies arbitrage. So that's not a, probably a good assumption. And the one with the yield curve is probably misleading in cross sections. So, so, and they're the ones who I think originally did effective duration and showed how to use it in the context of an actual model using the CIR model. So that's really an important paper. And it's like the ori original CIR uh, paper, uh, it's widely, I think those ideas are widely used in practice. Uh, the third paper, uh, Analysis of Variable Rate Loan Contracts, talks about um, uh, a whole bunch of different contracts and how you can value them using the same technology. And with different types, of, I mean, one of the things that's really nice about it is it, is it, it has some, some direct things like things where the bond yield is, is sensitive to the interest rate, but also has things with boundaries and, and looking at how the boundary conditions affect the valuation. And so that's actually uh, also just a very practical one. Uh, this paper uh, that I had with Steve and Chester, nobody knows about. I know that because it has like two citations. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think it's interesting that the, the it's, it's, it's maybe really capital theory, but it's, it's related to the term structure of interest rates. So it's been known for a long time that if you have just a, a value of uh, an activity as a function of, of the, uh, uh, as, a, as a function of the interest rate when there's a fixed interest rate, that uh, the value is, is uh, decreasing in the interest rate if you have first negative cash flows and then positive cash flows. And more generally, if you always have the option to truncate the project at any point in time, so so-called truncation technology. <laughs> and Steve had the idea, well, may, we have this interesting result. Maybe there's a sense in which the converse is true as well. And uh, the way that, that he structured the, the, the converse was to say, what if it's monotone in all the forward rates? And uh, you know, I think this is, a, this is a, a cute little paper, but it's a good example of Steve's creativity. He says it's the standard thing, and it's, the converse is really hard, because if you have a, even a single activity, you're talking about you know, whether a polynomial is monotone for positive R and stuff. But he said, you know, that's a narrow way of thinking about it. Don't think about a single interest rate. Think about all the interest rates. Uh, and then, you know, the monotonicity still works. And then you can also get a, a converse result. It's pretty cool. So, uh, so anyhow, uh, that's a, I think that's a good example of Steve's creative thinking. He's always thinking, you know, well, we, saw, we have this thing which involves A, B, and C. And we traditionally take B and C as given, we solve for A. What happens if we take A and B as given and solve for C? It's just, I mean, it's just a simple, simple kind of thing to think about. But you get all sorts of interesting things going on that way. And, and like a lot of Steve's thinking, it's like, it's so simple afterwards. It's like, well, you know, every, you know we should have done that. Why, why didn't we do that before? But uh, just, 
it's the way creativity is, I guess. I mean, most ideas are kind of simple ex post. Uh, it's very cool. Uh, so this paper, another Coxinger Saul Ross paper. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be careful saying anything because I know they've been plotting up there. <laughs> so I don't know what's, what's going to come next. But anyway, uh, this is, this is uh, largely about the expectations hypothesis. And that's, that's, that's uh, there. And, it, and the thing is, that it's interesting that, that the way the expectations hypothesis normally st stated traditionally is actually internally inconsistent. That if it, it holds at all points of time and all maturities, unless you have uh, om almost a riskless situation, then it doesn't work. And uh, then they, they propose ha using instead something called the local expectations hypothesis, which says that conditional on the information you have at some uh, point in time, then uh, you are going to uh, uh, that, you, that all assets will have the same ex expected return. This meaning all assets that are fixed income derivatives. And uh, so this is, this is interesting because this is the standard assumption that people use in practice if they're, if they're valuing the interest rate derivatives. They just assume that the actual probabilities are the risk neutral probabilities, which is what this amounts to. Uh, this, this paper is a paper where I, I replaced John, I'm sorry, <laughs> John Cox, uh, just for one paper worth. Um, this, this is a paper that's, that, that started because I had done some empirical work with uh, Stephen Brown doing, doing a sort of exploratory study of the Cox and Saul Ross model. And um, when, we, when we estimated the model, so we thought that a really good kind of spline for fitting the term structure is to take it from a model. So we took, we fitted uh, yield curve by yield curve, the Cox and Saul Ross model. Then we look at the time series of the parameters. And one thing you can back out is the asymptotic uh, long rate. And it's moving around, and we're going, well, it doesn't move around in the, in the Cox and Saul Ross model, and, but, it, and, but it does move around in the data. So uh, I should go build a model uh, where, where this is true. Now, I worked on this for a year or two. I had models with learning. I had models with, with uh, irreducible state spaces, reducible state spaces, Markov chains, all this other stuff. And all the examples that I went through, uh, either the asymptotic long rate didn't exist, or it was constant, or it rose. You can actually make it rise deterministically. <laughs> so it could be that the long rate is, is, is asymptotic long rate is 5% today, and it could be 6% tomorrow for sure. Uh, and it turns out that in those cases, the examples that we have, what you learn tomorrow is when it will switch. And that, the fact that, that the distribution of times when it switches could be long, long in the future is why the long rate can be smaller today than it is tomorrow. Uh, but anyway, I'm, after a while I'm going, well, maybe this isn't true. Uh, and one thing, Steve always had faith. This, this faith is part of doing research, is that while you're working on the idea, while you're doing a proof, you've got to have faith that it's true. And so for, you know, for a couple years, I had faith that I would find a counterexample, or, or find, find a model where the long forward rate moved around. And then I switched, and I had faith, like 100% faith, that I, that I could prove that it didn't. But that's when I got uh, uh, John and Steve enlisted. Um, I guess we have a problem with the time value of information, even, with, even without uh, John Cox. Because uh, we sat on this one for, for about 10 years or something after the first full version that was complete. The first version had finite Markov chains and prone Frobenius theorem. Uh, and it just, seemed, it just seemed like it wasn't the most general proof. And so uh, anyway, 
Uh, so we worked on it hard for about 10 years. And then uh, we, we sent it off to the Journal of Finance. And uh, the referee said, A, it was trivial. <laughs> and B, they, they, they criticized us. Says, who do the authors think they are to criticize so and so with their model? And I'm going, if you need to be somebody, doesn't, don't John and Steve do? So anyway, uh, uh, but we did, we did get it published. And, and I think that's a nice, nice set of results. The uh, last one I want to talk about is something Steve was talk, working on recently with the recovery theorem. So in Steve's uh, paper, The Recovery Theorem, he credits uh, Chris Rogers and me as coming up with the word recovery. Uh, and I thought it was nice that he credited us, but I was also a little disappointed because uh, my whole PhD thesis, of which he was the chairman, was also about recovery. <laughs> but this is a Steveism. He had forgotten about that. And he was just being very gracious and, and giving us credit. Um, uh, this is, Steve would sometimes say, if you don't like the, uh, the general version of the recovery theorem, this one with the, with the fixed income is, is better. And I think, I, I want to understand this better. I, I have some comments about it. And I, I guess I don't feel like I understand it quite well enough. But it's interesting because the implications of this model are inconsistent with Cox and saw ross so that's kind of a curious feature of it. Is that true or not? Or you, you're just, you just say phi on it. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> OK, so let me, let me talk a little bit more about the individual papers. So, so the idea of an affine model is actually where they started. They didn't call it affine model. They just look for uh, uh, model. They look at the pricing equation in terms of the mean and the variance. This is, again, stories. I mean, I'm, again, I'm the wrong person to be, to be uh, talking about this. You can correct me when I get it wrong, again. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, uh, this, is, this is the functional form that they're looking at, where where it would come out in terms of this way, the state variable. The main case they looked at was the square root model, uh, which is very popular. And they also uh, discovered a 3 half model. So they have a general theory um, of, of, of this, which is beyond these models. And then for these uh, kinds of models, they have closed form bond prices. And bond option prices, I forget if it's just for the square root model or for both. Uh, they have a lot of multi-factor models. You don't know how many papers I reviewed which said, we extended the cox singer saul ross model to a multi-factor model. OK, well, I've got advice. If you're going to build on somebody's model, read the whole paper. Because generally, those models that people had in these papers that have the two-factor generalization of, of cox singer saul ross um, have a less general model than they do. Maybe, maybe the, in their model, they allow for correlation in the two factors, but people in their extension don't allow that, things like that. And, they, and also, they have a different extra little piece, because some of, it is, some of the multi-factor models are like the real interest rate, the nominal interest rate, inflation, and, and expected inflation. So those are some really nice models. Those are, those are good. Uh, good uh, models uh, that you can work with. And uh, as I mentioned before, I think that the first paper came after the second paper, and that one of the, one of the big motivations of putting together the general equilibrium model was, to, was because it was hard to show whether, the, whether the, there was arbitrage or not. And the arbitrage issues are actually kind of subtle. Um, there's a, part, there's a section in there on viability, which I think uh, is at that time there was no way to kind of make it rigorous. I think that there's the work by, uh, uh, what's the right order? Heston, Lowenstein, and Willard have some, have some additional interest on that. The subtle thing is that uh, 
If the risk premium is positive when the interest rate is zero and the origin is accessible, it still is at the origin in a set of times of measure zero. So it's not clear how much profit you can make. And so, and that's actually a really subtle question. But that, I refer you to this uh, Heston, Lowenstein, and Willard paper, which is pretty cool. That paper, that's the same paper that shows that for some parameter values, the CEV model has a bubble not only in the call option prices, but also the stock price. So that's actually a really curious uh, thing to look at, pretty cool. But anyway, this is a, this is a great paper, a landmark paper. Um, this is the first time that we had a fully specified uh, uh, interest rate model where you could do bond op pricing, bond option pricing, and didn't have rates going negative, which is, of course, a sensible thing, especially if you're talking about nominal rates. Okay. I mentioned this, the duration and basic risk. I don't think there's anything more in here than what I said. Um, I talked about the variable rate loan contracts paper. Here's a list, I don't know if I got all of them, of different types of contracts that they valued in that paper. Uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, computing going on, and I don't remember if these are all in closed form or just most in closed form, but, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's a very nice uh, paper that, that can kind of lead the way for practitioners to value any kind of op optionality that's built into these fixed income contracts. Yeah, I talked about my paper with uh, Steve and Chester. Okay, I think I talked about this. Let me let me go this. So this one, this one is kind of I think is kind of interesting. Um, the uh, I didn't talk about it so much before. So um, you sh you think that the forward rate that you see today asymptotically would be some kind of average of the forward rates you're going to see tomorrow. Maybe different states have weights that depend on discount factors and probabilities and things, but you'd think that you'd think that uh, is some kind of average. But the thing that's interesting is that it, when, as a maturity increases, the convexity of the function e to the minus r t means that means that uh, you put almost all the weight on on the states with the lowest interest rates. Basically, uh, if you have uh, a state in which e to the minus integral rt is, uh, when the interest rates are big, e to the minus integral rt is very small, and that state almost doesn't count in computing the expectation. So the states that, that are significant at the long end are only the states that have the lowest interest rate realizations along the paths. And uh, as a result, you know, the, if you look at the the asymptotic interest rate today, it's the average, it's, a, it's something like the lowest one tomorrow, not, not uh, some kind of an average. And I think I talked about uh, the other one, other things. So I want to say just a word, I think I have one minute, about uh, the, the long bond paper, Martin and Ross. Um, this is interesting, and I think the curious thing to me about this paper is that this assumes uh, I, I, it, that, that we get results that are inconsistent with Cox, Singer, Saul, Ross. And uh, I think that the reason for that is because there are finitely many states. That in Cox, Singer, Saul, Ross, asymptotically, we, the, the long forward rate is, is constant, but asymptotically the yield curve has to go down, no matter, you know. So it looks, like, it looks like this or like this, but at the, at the long end it's going down. This result says it's always going up at the long end and on average, and it doesn't always go up or doesn't always go down unless, unless there's no randomness. And so, so this is, uh, I think that this is because of the finite number of states, which means that the interest rate can't be too big. I suspect that the that the term structure going down to long end is because these long excursions of very large interest rates. But I'm not sure. I think that's something I'd like to understand better. <laughs>
So that's all I wanted to say. Um, uh, I, I really miss Steve, but I feel like it's a little selfish in the sense that he had a great life. I mean, he did more in one life than most people did in, in seven lives. I mean, it's, it's just, just such a remarkable man and such a remarkable part of my life. This is a, a very bittersweet honor to talk about some of Steve's contributions to asset pricing. And uh, the whole I feel in my heart is only eased by looking at so many of you and realizing how much of Steve and his words and his philosophy is in you. So uh, Steve does live on. I don't know, this is a, a very old picture with the lights on, you can't really see this. Steve's 36 in this picture. Um, uh, this was my 24th birthday, and uh, it was a surprise party by, put on by the woman who was going to become my wife six years later. Um, and um, Steve gave me lots of lessons about relationships and, and good marriages as well, uh, including things like when I wasn't sure, I'd ask Steve what I should do. He said, marry her. Don't worry about other issues. Uh, the picture's partly cut off. You'll probably see more of it tonight, and you'll see you know, the beers and the hands and all this. And some of you were at this party. And if you don't remember, it's probably because of all the drugs you took at the party. Um, so I had met Steve about three years earlier. I was 20 years old, and uh, Steve was uh, somebody in the audience at a seminar, very young, challenging the speaker. Thought he was an interesting person, but I didn't know much about him until Doug Diamond uh, approached me. And uh, Doug had come to Yale because he was interested in finance, and James Tobin was one of the kings of finance at the time, which was a big attraction for Doug. And uh, Doug got to know Steve and told uh, a bunch of younger students at the time about what a wonderful uh, instructor intellect there was uh, doing finance. So we all took Steve's class. And uh, three years later, just before I went in the job market, we all were friends. And it was, it was a really wonderful time, both intellectually and, and from a, a friendship point of view. So this is November 14, 1980, and there's a lot that Steve has done in asset pricing uh, past that point. I'm not going to talk much about that. By this point in time, Steve actually had made most of the major contributions to asset pricing that we associate uh, with his name. By then, he had gotten interested in things like asymmetric information through his uh, good friend, Sandy Grossman. And I remember often sitting in, in Steve's office. It took a long time to get into Steve's office. His time was very precious because everybody loves to spend time with Steve. And I'd sit there, and we'd start talking, and the phone would ring, and it would be Sandy. And he was always calling up saying, Steve, I've got this proof of something that I think is really important. And just like we heard earlier, he'd call Steve and say, but I'm not sure the proof is right. Can you verify it for me? Um, so that was a lot of my memories uh, of Steve uh, back then. And his interest in asymmetric information and how that influenced asset pricing got carried over into a number of papers that he encouraged his graduate students to write, Paul Fleiter, not myself, ultimately carried forward into his interest in uh, performance evaluation. He wrote some brilliant papers uh, with Phil on the topic. He became important in empirical asset pricing uh, as well. He's developed uh, econo you know, econometric tests uh, of mean variance efficiency. He studied the impact of survivorship bias on what we infer empirically. Uh, in the papers with Richard Roll and uh, you know, Chen Roll and Ross paper, my uh, longtime co-author shared and I often commented in the 1980s, what was the best paper that was written 
uh, in the last few years in finance, and inevitably, it would be one of Steve's papers like Roland Ross. Uh, so Steve was really a giant, and he was a giant back then at age uh, 36. When he appeared at my surprise party, it was like Zeus coming down from Mount Olympus. Uh, he, was, he was that salient to me, and he, he always has been. So uh, rather than go paper by paper, because Steve was prolific as well as deep in what he did, I just want to speak mostly about his contributions in the 1970s, leaving most of the arbitrage pricing theory uh, to Andy, and, and try and, uh, just from my understanding of Steve, talk about how all of these contributions are related and how they evolved one into the other. Steve, as we heard today, had really no formal training uh, in finance. He obviously knew general equilibrium theory, and he knew about, you know, Aero de Bruce securities as a way of dealing with uncertainty, in addition to what Doug said, that you know, finance is an area of economics where you make strong assumptions and you get strong results because we have great data. He also talked about finance more generally as just the economics of uncertainty. But I think his epiphany about uncertainty came from a, a couple of lectures that he heard at Wharton, and he's mentioned that in some video slides that you know, we've uh, posted at the FARFI, the organization dedicated to Steve and, and now his memory. Uh, the first of those was a paper that Fisher Black gave at Wharton, the Black-Scholes model. And Steve was really struck by this idea of replication and how something as simple as being able to dynamically trade one security, the underlying security, and value another was something that he thought should be more general than just focusing on the pricing of a simple derivative or a simple call option. And he, at some level, understood that this was tied up with the idea found in Eero de Bru of market completeness versus market incompleteness. And he wrote a series of papers because he was a great mathematician, a great topologist. He could visualize math geometrically and convey it to you in a way, to me, that nobody else could. Um, and when you start thinking about just pricing ordinary stocks, your first reaction might be, if you were somebody who didn't have all this formal training and baggage in finance that tells you what you can and can't do, it says, well, if we can do this with options on a stock, why can't we do this with stocks in general? After all, you know, there's tons of securities out there, and we can dynamically trade them. And even if we couldn't just dynamically trade them, is there, isn't there something we could say about how close we can get to valuing assets in relation to the prices of other assets? Steve was always into saying valuation is really an issue of relative pricing. How does a securities price relate to the values of other securities? So I think one of his first forays into this was in the static finite state space framework, and he wrote a paper that has almost a thousand citations to it uh, called Options and Efficiency. It appeared in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. And a lot of people think of this as a paper that says, well, the reason we have options is because they make markets more efficient. I think he was trying to think about this in terms of the idea of replication and the notion that if we could somehow complete the market with enough securities, and let's just forget about stocks, let's think about options, and let's think about dynamic trading, which would come about this, even if we're thinking about a static setting. We can get back to that Aero de Brew world where valuation is so simple. He also thought about equilibrium as a way uh, to generate a, a type of quasi-completeness. Uh, he tells a story about writing this paper that appeared in the Journal of Economic Theory where he derived the necessary and sufficient conditions for K-fund separation to exist. And basically it involves projecting all asset returns, the returns, say, of stocks, on what we call the K-separating portfolios. And as long as the residual from that projection has a conditional expectation that's zero, given the returns of the K-separating portfolios, you have you know, the necessary and sufficient conditions for distributions alone to tell you that everybody with uh, a utility function would want to hold these K funds in some combination. 
Well, that's related to asset pricing is because it tells you that there are really only then K parameters that people care about. They're the, the projections onto these separating portfolios. And ultimately, these distributional assumptions are what led to his insight that Andy's going to talk about in the arbitrage pricing theory. If we write out what a factor model is, uh, Steve firmly believed that we're really going to get you know, something very, very close to exact pricing. The devil, of course, is in uh, the details. And the detail that Steve tried to nail down, which is how much of a deviation will we get from this exact k-factor pricing when we make these distributional assumptions, that a factor model is a distributional assumption, and come up with uh, an asset pricing uh, equation. And he tried to use the principle of no arbitrage to show how close you can get. And for the most part, Steve, yes, he was a great mathematician. His proofs are generally right on. But he often was more interested in the truth than in the details, dotting the I's and crossing the T's. The fact that any one asset out of an infinite number of assets is not perfectly priced by the arbitrage pricing theory equation wasn't a big deal to Steve. After all, the set of assets of which you can have you know, a, a deviation is of measure zero. So for all intent and purpose from an empirically observable point of view, and the way we teach the arbitrage pricing theory to our students is if, if this firm-specific risk doesn't exist. It doesn't exist for well-diversified portfolios. He's, we spend a lot of time when we think about this paper on the details of how big can the deviation be across a number of assets. But for Steve, it wasn't really that important. He had shown his point. The quantification of this is of the deviations are relatively small. And he left it to others, like Greg Connor, to come up with a few extra assumptions, equilibrium assumptions. Myself in a paper I wrote with Sheridan Titman, Phil wrote a paper to talk about how big those deviations are. And when n is large, almost every reasonable assumption that you make says, those deviations ought to be pretty small. Um, now, um, Steve stressed to his students that when markets are complete, valuation is, is very simple. It comes out of the whole Aero de Brew framework. But it has a beauty to it as well. He wrote a very nice paper, one of my favorite papers of Steve's, called A Simple Approach to the Valuation of Risky Streams. It appeared in the Journal of Business, and it's got a number of insights built up from examples and a general theorem uh, built into it as well. He takes the case of a corporate cash flow and says, look, we can make this corporate cash flow, which is contingent on a bunch of traded securities. And if we're very clever about it, and of course Steve was as clever as they come, we can actually price those corporate cash flows, even though they seem very complex, some of them are uh, just, uh, they look like dividend streams and then they end. If we're just clever about how we dynamically try to replicate, much like the Black-Scholes model, these cash flows, we can come up with an exact value for these uncertain risky streams. And in that paper, as well as uh, uh, paper that's kind of a precursor of the arbitrage pricing theory, the paper in the chapter in the Bixler and Friend book, Risk Return and Arbitrage, and ultimately also in Cox and Ross. I think Steve and his, some of his co-authors came up with this really remarkable insight. And for example, the simple approach to the valuation of risky streams, he's got a, a theorem that he used to teach his students at the end of the chapter making use of the separating hyperplane theorem, which basically says if you have no arbitrage, there's a linear valuation operator. There's some assumptions in there. You know, we talk about you know, boundedness in some of the other papers. It's finite state spaces. But he had the basic idea very early on in his career from studying this issue of replication and understanding what happens with completeness, what happens with incompleteness, that, in fact, 
you know, there are these linear valuation model, um, linear valuation operators that we use today and call the fundamental theorem of asset pricing and that we attribute to Harrison and Krebs. The devil's in the details and he didn't polish off every detail there. He didn't go from the separating hyperplane theorem to what is it, the han Banach theorem and general function spaces, but he understood that basic idea. And when he went and started to write this paper with uh, John Cox on the valuation of options for alternative uh, stochastic processes, very impressive number of sites there, uh, he was already, I think, familiar, and maybe John can give some historical perspective on this, on what we come to know today as the Q measure versus the P measure and, and sort of how they all interact. Because in the Cox and Ross paper, as John uh, alluded to, there's this idea that if we can actually value assets purely by replication and the principle of no arbitrage, or the law of one price, as some others call it, um, we might as well value them in the simplest framework possible. And in the case of the paper with John on, on options that have like Poisson events attached to them, that simplest framework is the risk neutral uh, approach. And I'll illustrate that with his uh, binomial model shortly. So the basic idea behind the risk neutral valuation approach is we outline the state space. If we've got a security that depends on the value of another security for each one of those possible states where we know one security, we know the value of this other security, and we assign probabilities to those states. And Steve and, and John's idea was just assign probabilities that would exist if the economy had a representative investor, a pricing investor who was risk neutral. And once we have those risk neutral probabilities, we can value any asset from those risk neutral probabilities. And I saw that firsthand when I worked for, for Eric on Wall Street, and I saw the actual code that was written at Solomon Brothers. That's how it was done. We had our risk neutral uh, numbers off of the term structure of interest rates. And whenever they wanted to trade a security, whether it was Greg or Eric, all you did was you pulled in the, the risk neutral uh, probabilities for that day, discount them, and voila, that was the fair value that Solomon Brothers uh, proprietary arm trading desk uh, was, was using. I'm sorry? I was the problem. I didn't go to long-term capital. Sorry, I went back to UCLA, paradise, all right. So, uh, you know, one of the best ways to illustrate the, the power of Steve's thinking was in this paper that has all kinds of ramifications for pedagogy, for computation of complex problems on Wall Street, and for most people's general understanding of how finance, and in particular, the valuation of derivatives works. And Steve, of course, being the great topologist, says, look, you know, if we're gonna have something that's kind of like a complete market, and we're gonna illustrate this in discrete time, we have to talk about binomial states. And that's the only way, kind of the number of replicating assets over small periods of time is gonna be sufficient to track another security. And that's the basic idea behind the Cox, Ross, and Rubinstein model, all right? And um, it's more general than the Black-Scholes model because it can price anything. As somebody said earlier, it can price American options. Uh, any kind of complex example you want, you can do with this. And I'll just use it because this is an audience that really doesn't need to fully understand this model. I'll just breeze through and for those who aren't finance oriented, talk about how this very simple model works with an example, all right? So I'm first gonna talk about a one-step binomial model. We got a stock, the stock is trading currently at $20. And one period from now, the two states of the world that make this market effectively complete uh, have the stock valued at $22 or at $18. 
Fairly simple example, all right? And now we're going to try and price a call option on that stock. We're going to say the maturity of the call option is three months. I'm going to say the risk-free rate's 4% per year compounded quarterly. So we're keeping this simple. Risk-free rate per period is 1%. And the strike price of this option is going to be $21. So remember, we're going to have a picture where the stock's at 22 or the stock's at 18. This is a building block of the binomial option pricing model. And in those states, the call is worth either a dollar or zero. We can value that call in one of two ways. We can use the old replicating method or we can use the risk neutral method. So how would we do this with the replicating method? We'd sit and look and say, look, the spread between the stock price between the two states is $4. The spread between the option price is $1. So if we were to actually try and replicate the option with a share of stock, we'd be, have four times too much spread. So instead of buying a share to replicate the option, we buy a quarter of a share. This is baby finance for most of you. I recognize that. Now, if we buy a quarter of a share, we have a little bit of a problem because a quarter of a share of stock isn't worth a dollar, it's worth 550 over here and it's worth 450 over here. We need to somehow translate 550 and 450 into one and zero if we're gonna fully replicate this option. So we just gotta get rid of $4.50 in both of the states. So what do we do? We borrow the present value of $4.50 at the risk-free rate. And now all of a sudden we got a portfolio quarter of a share of stock, borrowing the present value of uh, uh, five, what did I say? Let's go back. <laughs> Borrow the present value of 450 and ask what that's worth today. Under the principle of no arbitrage, that gives us the value of the call. The value of the call is going to be 54 cents because a quarter of a share of stock co costs $5 and at 1% per period, the present value of 450, which is needed to get the payoffs of uh, 550 and 450 down to one and zero in the future, uh, discounting that at the 1% per period gives us the value of the call at 54 cents. Fairly straightforward. We can do this another way though. And this was the great insight of the Cox and Ross paper that ultimately, with Steve's other work, really becomes the fundamental theory of asset pricing. We can say, what are the probabilities we should assign? I call them magical probabilities because they do all kinds of wonderful things. What are the probabilities that we should assign to the state where the stock is worth $22 and the state where the stock is worth $18? Well, in a risk-neutral world, these probabilities, not the true probabilities, but the risk-neutral probabilities, should make the expected value, future value of that stock, appreciate at 1%. So we simply solve this equation and we find out that the risk-neutral probability we attach to the upstate is 0.55, the risk-neutral probability we attach to the downstate is 0.45, and then, we come up with the expected value of the call in this risk neutral world, discounted at 1%, and magically we come up with the same answer. This is obviously a, an example I teach my students, but it makes something that was so hard, it takes something that was the realm of people who we farmed out of the jet propulsion laboratory, who could solve all kinds of complicated differential equations, who suddenly say, the world of options and derivatives is open to me. And you can do this with all kinds of more complicated derivatives. You want to price a put? You already have the probabilities. They're stored in Eric Rosenfeld and Greg Hawkins' computer. It's 0 0.55, 0 0.45. So if you got a put option, for example, with a strike price of $23 for the same stock, voila. In the upstate, the put option's worth a buck. In the bad state, where the stock is $18, it's worth $5. Apply the same probabilities, 0.55 times 1, 0.45 times 5, discount at 1%, and lo and behold, you come up with the value of the put, 2.77. You can do this with algebra rather than just numbers. 
And if you do this with algebra, you have a building block of the binomial option pricing formula that when compounded with backward incursion gives you something that looks ugly. But it's not, it's pretty here. This tells you what the risk neutral probability is in terms of the risk free rate and the spread between the appreciation of the stock in the up and the down state. And the way it's done in a full blown example is you build these binomial trees and you work little treelets at a time. Here, the risk neutral probabilities are 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and the discount rate is 25%. But I basically ask students, knowing this about the stock, what should the option be? Well, it's 0 0.5 times this plus 0 0.5 times this, discounted at 25%. Fill that question mark here. Do the same thing down here. Once you have those two, you can go backwards. You can build this up as much as you want. You can program it. The fact that you can do this so simply revolutionize the understanding and the practice uh, of finance. Um, so to sum up, Steve was just a remarkable guy. Um, intellectually, um, so much of what he did in the period just before you saw that picture, I mean, I don't know, it was a six years, seven years, or eight years, truly remarkable, especially for somebody uh, who really had no formal training in finance. He figured almost all of this stuff out, you know, on his own. Um, in my life, I think he's one of the most creative minds I've ever seen, and maybe one of the most creative minds in the social sciences. He just thought differently from everybody else. Um, and Steve never lost it. So uh, Steve did develop a, a recent paper, and we talked a little bit uh, in side audiences about the controversy surrounding it. Uh, the story behind this paper is he came out to UCLA as a distinguished visitor a few years ago. And, you know, I thought, oh, this is great. Steve's got an office three doors away from me. And there's nothing, as most of you know, like spending time with Steve. So I'd knock on his door and I'd say, Steve, you're here at UCLA. I'd love to talk to you. And Steve says, I'm busy. I'm working on something. And I say, okay, well, I'll come back, you know. When should I come back? Well, come back at 4 o'clock. And you knock on his door again. And you could tell he was really wrapped up in something at that point. And he was working on the paper that's now called the Recovery Theorem. Yes, Phil wrote a paper, Recovering Additive Utility. Uh, I don't know where the word really came from. And whatever the views about you know, compactness or boundedness or station or how strong the assumptions are, nobody's going to deny that this was an incredibly creative idea. And you never know, as Steve told his students, where creative ideas are going to lead to. And he talks about we can value all kinds of fixed income securities and figure out the physical probabilities using the uh, recovery uh, theorem that he develops. Um, but, you know, there was another great genius of the, the 20th century named Einstein who did stuff late in life on what he thought had to be true, which was a unified field theory. And everybody said, well, I don't know that you can link electromagnetism and the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force at MIT. I know everybody knows what these are. Um, I think you never know with a creative mind like Steve's where this recovery theorem and the ability to understand physical probabilities is going to lead. Maybe like the APT, we don't have you know, the exact physical probabilities. Maybe only in cir certain circumstances we can get small deviations from those probabilities. But it's a step in the right direction. And it was something that was incredibly creative coming out of somebody who at some point in his career just said, I'm going to go to UCLA, spend six weeks and work on something and not talk to anybody until I've got it figured out. Then he pops out and says, Mark, I got this great idea. What do you think about it? I said, I don't really understand it. But uh, we talked and talked and talked and talked, and I got the gist of it after a while. Um, so anyway, I, I miss Steve. And uh, I'm, all of us 
here do too. He's, he's, he's more than a mentor. He's more than a teacher. He's larger than life uh, emotionally. I, I do remember my last conversation with him, and it's a source of great angst to me. Um, it was during the American Finance Association meetings, and Steve's just, this guy's time is so valuable, you know, but when he says, come, you come. And he says, Mark, I'm in Chicago. I have seats at this incredible restaurant that nobody can get reservations to. Would you like to join me? And boy, I sure would have liked to have joined him. But I, and I was close. I wasn't in Chicago. I was in Detroit. But I was running 101 degree fever. And, uh, and it is a whole other story to this. So we had a long conversation. Uh, we talked about Carol and, uh, you know, how he's doing and, and all this other stuff. We actually talked about the afterlife. We talked about politics. Um, and then I said, well, you're coming to Los Angeles in a few weeks. I'll probably see you then, right? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll ring you up. Uh, i let you know exactly when I'm getting to Los Angeles. And I said, come over to my house and eat. I didn't have dinner with him that night. And despite the 101 degree fever, despite being in Detroit, I think it was one of the biggest mistakes of my life. So anyway, that's all I have to say. Andy? So I'd like to uh, start by joining Leonid in um, welcoming and thanking all of you for coming here to MIT uh, to celebrate uh, Steve Ross. Um, unlike many of the speakers and those of you in the audience, I never had the privilege of calling Steve my advisor. Um, the closest I ever got was um, I actually started as an undergraduate at Yale in 1977, the same year that Steve was there. And in 1980, I took a PhD course in um, uh, general equilibrium theory with Herb Scarf, and Anad Mahdi was a classmate of mine. So that, that's the closest I ever got. Um, but uh, like most of us in finance, I feel like I've been a student of Steve's because I read his papers before I met him and was just astonished by the things that he was able to do and the simplicity and beauty with which he did them. So um, I, uh, then I got to be his colleague here at MIT, which is an extraordinary uh, privilege. Uh, in fact, his office is literally right next to mine. And so I got to st see Steve on a pretty regular basis. During the semesters that he was teaching, you just knew that he was around because he'd walk into the room, walk into the hallway, and the place would just light up. It would just, he's that kind of an energetic, positive influence. And, uh, uh, a week before he died, uh, he was on the phone with me talking about uh, an idea that uh, he and I had been discussing, applying you know, finance to developing uh, funds for uh, cancer drug development. And he said he actually found a, um, a large pension fund that would be perfect for investing in such an instrument. And uh, would I be interested in talking with him about it? So he was just involved in so many different things with so many different people. It's, uh, it's just hard to imagine the, uh, the holes that he's left uh, in our lives. But I think that there's a, a, a real positive element to today's uh, uh, proceedings because uh, one of the wonderful things about academia is that many of those who have left us, uh, they're still with us through their ideas, their theories, their research. And so uh, I have the great uh, honor of being able to talk about one of Steve's most important ideas, uh, one of my favorite, which is the arbitrage pricing theory. Now, I'm not sure I'm the best person to be talking about this. There are many people in the audience that are far more qualified than me. Uh, I have not been often mistaken for a theorist. But there's a reason that I think that empiricists and econometricians ought to be really interested in the APT. And I'll describe why in a few minutes. There's some really beautiful things about it that really bring theory together with practice. So I want to start by the creation myth that uh, most finance professors uh, perpetrate uh, on their students, uh, I being no exception. And the creation myth is this. Uh, in the beginning, and uh, by the beginning I mean 1964, 
In the beginning, Bill Sharp said, let there be beta, and there was beta, and it was good. Uh, this really is the cornerstone of what we teach even today in introductory finance. The fact that there's this risk-reward trade-off, it's linear, and you can measure systematic risk by this thing called beta. But we know, of course, that this theory, the capital asset pricing model, relies on a number of pretty significant assumptions, counterfactual assumptions like quadratic utility or multivariate normality, and that supply equals demand. Now, we typically don't talk about those assumptions applied company. We teach the theory, and we show the numbers, and we use this in our capital budgeting exercises. But the bottom line is that there's some really troubling aspects about this theory. In 1976, Steve published a paper titled The Arbitrage Theory of Capital Asset Pricing. And what he was able to do was to completely change the way we think about this risk-reward relationship in a very, very different context. And so with, with your indulgence, I'm going to actually derive for you the arbitrage pricing theory. I know that mo many of you here don't need me to do that for you. But there's some really interesting aspects that I'd like to point out, things that, that I view from my own perspective as being important that, that, that maybe you don't. So this is a, a personal perspective. And so uh, if I get it wrong, please uh, don't uh, blame the message. It's the messenger's fault. But uh, I'm hoping that you'll see that there's some really interesting aspects that may not be apparent unless you're looking at it from an empirical or econometric point of view. So the arbitrage pricing theory can be developed in three easy steps. The first step is to start by assuming that there's a linear factor model that generates stock returns. So, whoops, the fonts didn't come out here. Apologize. Uh, oh, that, let me. Uh, Jeez, um, that's, uh, that's going to be a problem. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to use the board. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to assume that the return on the i asset is going to be given by its mean plus some uh, constant beta times a factor lambda plus an epsilon. And we're going to assume that the x, oh, sorry. OK, uh, let's see. How do I do that? Um, getting closer. There we go. I think the, maybe the board lights are over there. Ah, yeah, great. Thank you. Where the, uh, the expected um, factor uh, value is equal to the expected residual, is equal to the expected cross product, which is equal to zero. So this is the simplest possible representation that one might be able to assume for what generates returns. And now, to a theorist, this might be a problem. You know, why are you assuming this? Why is it linear? But to an empiricist, this is really a pretty natural thing to do. It's not really saying a whole lot. All you're saying is that returns have this common factor structure. And uh, you don't know what it is, but it's there. And so now we're going to talk about what this means. So we start with this as an assumption that there is a linear factor representation. And I'm going to write this in matrix notation, if you don't mind. I'm going to write it as the return vector is going to be given by a vector of means plus <clears throat> a vector of betas times its common factor and a vector of residuals. That's the first step. The second step is to construct an arbitrage portfolio. Now, what's that? This is a portfolio that has the following characteristics. The weights sum to 0, which is a really weird thing. Most of us are used to thinking about a portfolio as weights summing to 1. But in fact, there's a very special aspect of these arbitrage portfolios. So if you've got a portfolio, call it omega, uh, let's say uh, omega A, and you sum the uh, uh, elements, so I'm taking an inner product with a vector of ones, that's going to be equal to 0 under this arbitrage portfolio assumption. It means that there's no net investment. I'm putting in $100 for one security, $25 for another security, shorting $125 for a third security, the sum is equal to zero. I've invested nothing. OK. So we now take an arbitrage portfolio of these returns, 
And what do we get? Well, let's just multiply it out. What we get <clears throat> are, let me erase this. We get that the return of portfolio A, RA, is going to be given by the inner product of this vector of weights times the returns. But we've assumed that there's a factor structure. So we can multiply this out. And what we get is three terms here, omega A mu plus omega A beta lambda plus omega A epsilon. Right? And now, what we can show with this arbitrage portfolio is something really interesting. The first point that we can make is that if this is a large enough portfolio, then when you take a, a weighted average of the residuals, it's approximately 0. In fact, you can prove this by the law of large numbers, that with a large enough portfolio, as long as the epsilons are roughly unrelated to each other, idiosyncratic is what we call it, then with that large portfolio, the idiosyncratic risk is going to go away. That's the first point. Now, the second point that Steve made was, let's choose this arbitrage portfolio to have a particular characteristic. Let's choose the arbitrage portfolio such that when you take the inner product with this vector of betas, these arbitrary weights that represent these returns in the economy, we're going to set these omega weights so that this, too, is equal to 0. Now, can you always do that? Well, it turns out that uh, as long as you have enough securities and as long as the betas aren't weird, Yes, you can always do that. It's actually really easy to do that. If you've got 1,000 securities with various different kinds of betas, it's easy to find a set of weights that both sum to 0. And also, when you multiply them by the betas, they also sum to 0. So what does that mean? That means that with this particular arbitrage portfolio, this portfolio with the weights sum to 0, and where we've constructed them so that its weighted beta is equal to 0, when we apply this to the definition of what the returns look like, what we're left with is that the return of this portfolio is a constant. It's a portfolio that has no idiosyncratic risk, and it also has no factor risk. It's got no risk at all. And so now, here's the third step. The third step is the no arbitrage condition. And this is the most beautiful result that I'd seen at that time when I was a grad student when I went through this. Steve pointed out that if you've got a portfolio that costs you nothing and that has no risk, it's just, it just has this return. If it costs you nothing and it has no risk, its return better be equal to 0. Because if it's anything other than 0, you should call him, and he will be happy to take care of that situation for you. You can make money with it. So, so that's the arbitrage condition, the no arbitrage condition, that, that if these two conditions hold, then it must be that this quantity is equal to 0. Now, that might not seem like we did a whole lot. You know, we invested nothing, we, we got no risk, and therefore we got no return. But this is an extraordinary, extraordinary conclusion. Why? Well, let me see. This may not, this may not work because of the fonts. But it turns out that it's the geometry of the situation that actually gives you all of the insights. Now, it was mentioned by a number of people that Steve had this you know, geometric intuition. And, uh, so this is a, a proof positive about it. So the way the intuition goes is this. What we've said as no arbitrage is if you have a portfolio that is uh, going to have zero uh, weight uh, in sum and has zero average beta, then it's got a zero return. 
So let me translate this into the language that Steve used from the geometric perspective. We know that when you uh, multiply two vectors, it's taking an inner product. And when that is set equal to 0, that's tantamount to saying that the two vectors are perpendicular to each other, right? It's from high school geometry. So this no arbitrage condition can be reinterpreted as a geometric observation. And here's the geometric observation. You've got a vector of ones. That's the iota. And you've got a vector of betas. That's the black line. And there are various different angles. Doesn't matter what they are. And the intuition that Steve used to derive the APT is this. Whenever you have a vector that is perpendicular to both this iota and beta, so that's this vector there, whenever that vector is perpendicular to iota and beta, it has to be perpendicular also to the vector of means, mu. So let me repeat this, because this is a really huge insight. Whenever you've got a portfolio that's perpendicular to iota and also perpendicular to beta, it has to, by no arbitrage, it has to also be perpendicular to the mu vector. The only way this can happen, the only way that this can always be true for any arbitrary omega that satisfies two conditions is if that mu vector lies in the same plane as the iota and beta vectors. That's the geometric intuition. So when Steve first got here and taught the PhD course, I was actually one of the uh, students sitting in the back of the room. I was a faculty at the time, but I got there a bit earlier than Zhang, so I was able to get a seat. And I remember the day that Steve derived this. And I'd already read about it years ago, but to see him derive it, and then he pointed out, he said, he was just really, really pleased with this insight that he had. And you can prove this much more formally, but this is basically how he thought of it. And he said, you know, this to me is one of the most beautiful things about the theory. And he says, I've presented this several times, and some people find it beautiful, and some people don't. And if you don't find it beautiful, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> so. So what does this mean? Well, um, I, I'm not going to be able to uh, uh, show you on the slides here. But the bottom line is that uh, this says that this vector mu, it lies in the same plane as these two vectors, iota and beta. Another way of saying that is that they're weighted averages of the two. So you can have omega 1 times this one vector plus uh, uh, gamma 2 times this second vector, beta. And that's what the, the mean vector is made up of. It's just it's in the same plane as these two vectors. Well, so what? Well, the so what is that we can actually solve for gamma 1 and gamma 2. And let's just plug in some things to see what they will be. So if this equation holds for all assets in my economy, as it does based on this proof, then it should definitely hold for any one of them. So let's just take one asset, the risk-free rate. The risk-free rate has a mean of RF. And it has no beta. It's, not, it's got no factor risk. So it's beta is 0. So I just figured out what gamma 1 is. Gamma 1 is the risk-free rate. So now let's take, a second, uh, let's take a second asset. Let's take an asset that happens to have a beta of 1. And certainly, that's possible. right? You can come up with a, a different vector, call it uh, portfolio omega m. And uh, let's just suppose that this omega happens to have, uh, when you combine it with all of the betas, this is equal to 1. It's a unit beta portfolio. Well, if we plug that in here, what we get is that the expected return on this unit beta portfolio is going to be equal to the risk-free rate plus gamma 2 times the beta of the unit portfolio, which by definition is 1. So now we have gamma 2. Gamma 2 is just the excess return on the unit beta portfolio, which means that we have the expected return is equal to RF plus uh, beta 
times the expected Rm minus Rf. This is the capital asset pricing model relation. Nowhere have I assumed normality or quadratic utility, and most importantly, nowhere have I assumed equilibrium. And this is an important point to Steve. He obviously knew very well general equilibrium theory. He wrote a thesis on trade theory. But he actually felt that this argument, this no arbitrage argument, was much more robust. Because look at the things that you don't have to assume. Now, you do have to pay some cost. You have to assume linearity. But there's a lot of things that you don't have to assume. And that's the power of these results. Now, it turns out that uh, you can make the exact same argument for multiple factors. So if instead of assuming that there's only one factor here, if I assume that this is factor one, and I've got factor two, and I've got factor three, then you can actually derive a multivariate version of a cap M, multiple factors. And it's linear. And there are multiple betas. You could have a market beta, a credit beta, an oil beta, lots of different betas. This was the first representation of this multi-factor model of asset returns. Now, you know, as Mark and others have said, Steve's intuition was uh, you know, far faster than uh, the ability to, to de deal with all of the details. He did deal, dealt with many of them, of course, but he just didn't have patience for some of them because he just knew it was true. He didn't need to uh, go through the, the motions. Other people did and, in fact, demonstrated, uh, including papers by Gary Chamberlain, uh, Chamberlain and Rothschild and Greg Connor, that not only were, was his intuition correct, but it really gave rise to a very different way of thinking about asset pricing models, using a large cross-section of assets and not having to think about equilibrium, even though, of course, you can embed this in an equilibrium model. So, you know, we also mentioned that, that uh, Steve was a, uh, a student of physics, majored in physics at Caltech. And many of you know that economists have this disease we call physics envy. You know, we would love to be able to uh, use the principles of physics to derive all of these kinds of interesting economic behaviors. When I pointed this out to one of my physics colleagues, he said, you know what, you guys, you don't have physics envy. And, and I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, if economists really had physics envy, they'd behave like physicists. And I said, in what way don't we behave like physicists? And he responded by saying that, you know, when physicists have a theory, they take it to the data. And when the data are inconsistent with the theory, they reject the theory. You guys reject the data. <laughs> and, you know, it's true. Most of us, we, it's probably better to say we have theory envy, but not Steve. He was a real physicist in the sense that he believed that it wasn't enough to just do the theory. He wanted to take it to the data, and so he did. So uh, Steve published a paper in 1980 on an empirical investigation of the APT. But the way he did it was to use traditional methods of econometricians, climatricians, psychologists, he used factor analysis. And it turns out that while the, theory had, so the, while the empirical work supported the theory to a certain uh, respect, there were inconsistencies and ambiguities because of the so-called rotation problem with factor analysis. Um, you know, Naifu Chen also looked at uh, you know, some aspects of that kind of uh, empirical test and was subject to the same criticism. In fact, there are a number of people that argued you can't really test the APT in the same way that you cannot test the uh, CAPM. Uh, Phil and Steve wrote a re response to that. And lots of other papers uh, were written to try to take the theory and apply it in practice, including Lehman and Modest uh, and uh, Connor and Karajcek. But the paper that I want to just spend a couple more minutes on is a paper that Mark referred to, which is Chen Roll and Ross. This was a paper where they actually abandoned factor analysis because of the ambiguity of not knowing what the factors are. And what they did in this paper was to say, you know, we're going to just decide from an economic perspective what we think the relevant factors are. And they demonstrated that these factors beyond the standard market factor actually had some significant explanatory power for the cross-section of expected returns. So as Phil alluded to, this was actually um, uh, before Fama and French did their three-factor model. Uh, and of course, there were many theories that have been developed since then and even before Bob Merton's 
paper about intertemporal cap M that suggested other, other factors, but in my view, this was the very first paper that actually took seriously the fact that there are other factors and identified what those are, took a stand, estimated them, and tried to understand how, how they predicted uh, cross-section of expected returns. Now, you know, Fama and French in 1992 actually made this fashionable because they published a paper where they showed some empirical evidence that the cross-section is not very well explained by beta and that book to market and uh, market cap uh, actually added uh, more explanatory power. And you know, in 1992, there was an interesting article published in the New York Times about this. I mean, the Fama French paper actually made the New York Times. And the only reason I know about it was because one of my MBA students pointed it out to me and was very concerned. We were teaching them the cap M and Fama here says the cap M is dead. So I had to explain this. And in this newspaper article, it's really fascinating to see all of the elements of academia coming together. So first of all, with this paper published, the fact that the cap M is dead, they interviewed Bill Sharp and said, you know, Bill, what do you think about this? <laughs> so Sharp is quoted as saying, well, you know, these are remarkable empirical results of historical data. But I'm not prepared to abandon the idea that there is a trade-off between risk and reward in a forward-looking basis. So you would expect that he would say that. Then they interviewed Dick Roll, and they asked Dick, what do you think about this? And Dick said, well, you know, we've known for a while that there are other factors, uh, like, for example, the APT. And so when you read this newspaper, you see all of the people saying the standard things that you would expect them to say. With the benefit of hindsight, it actually turns out that all of them are right in really interesting ways. So I want to just close with that. I want to talk in the last few minutes about Steve's practical impact because it relates to where we are today with the APT. So as many of you know, uh, Steve uh, started up an asset management company with Dick Roll. And you know, Anat mentioned uh, this idea of financial marketing that Steve wrote about in the paper. But what she didn't say, and I think all of you know this anyway, is that Steve was a consummate marketer. He was extraordinarily good at marketing the services of his firm. And you know, we tend to think in finance and more broadly in academia that marketing is somehow you know, sleazy and um, you know, inappropriate. But Steve's perspective of marketing is actually um, communication and education. And he was extraordinary at both. And so what he ended up doing was communicating and educating all sorts of clients of his, pension plan sponsors, that were smarter because they invested with Roland Ross Asset Management. One of the issues that pension funds have to deal with, that, that was the majority of the clients of Roland Ross Asset Management, pension funds have a problem. They've got a bunch of assets and liabilities, and hopefully the assets will match, if not exceed, those liabilities. Otherwise, this is a problem. And the assumption that the pension funds typically make is that the assets need to grow at a certain rate. So for example, in 2016, CalPERS target return for their $311 billion portfolio was it has to grow at about 7.5% in order to make assets line up with liabilities. Now 7.5% may not seem like that much in some grand scheme of things, but actually today, that's a very, very aggressive assumption. And in fact, if you take a look at the 10-year record of CalPERS, uh, oh, these are um, estimates of what other leading pension funds are assuming, all on the order of 5 to 7 to 8% return. Over the last 10 years, CalPERS rate of return has been more like 5% on their assets. So that's a big gap. And because that gap is there, their assets are becoming less and less relative to their liabilities. Their, their shortfall is growing. And so pension funds have a real problem. What do you do about this? Now, this is not a new problem. This existed when Roll and Ross Asset Management were in business. And what they were uh, asked to do by their pension fund clients is to tell, tell them how. How do we meet our obligations by getting better returns? And so you can think of all sorts of kinds of things that you'd say to a pension fund client. right? You need alpha, not beta. You need to come up with uh, you know, uh, unique sources of investment acumen. And by the way, I've got all sorts of snake oil that I can sell you uh, that will convince you that uh, you've got alpha. But that's not what Roland Ross did. What they did was to go back to the APT. And they said, yes, you've got a problem. Market risk premium is at 5 or 6%, not historically 8.3. And you need to get up to 7.5%. How are you going to do that? We'll tell you how. You need to take additional factor risk. 
you need to, instead of just investing in market risk, you need credit risk, oil risk, liquidity risk. You need to take advantage of all sorts of other risk premia. And by the way, we can measure that for you. And that's what they did. And their clients have benefited from that advice. So uh, where does that leave us today? Well, um, if you think about practical impact, uh, let's just do a quick uh, metric. Um, if you do a Google search for the capital asset pricing model, you get uh, 7.6 million hits as of yesterday. If you do a Google search of arbitrage pricing theory, um, you only get 360,000 hits. Now, that seems real surprising given how well known and how important the APT is. And it's because the industry, they don't care about academic names and they don't care about citations, they care about ideas. And the idea of the APT and this multi-factor representation, the industry has given it a new name. Anybody know what that new name is? Smart beta, smart beta. So I know that that sounds like a stupid name to most of us in academia, but that's what it's called in the industry. And so let's just do a search of smart beta. Smart beta has 97.8 million hits. And lest you think that we're simply giving Steve credit where credit isn't due, let's just take a look at a typical smart beta product. First of all, point out that you know, as of a few months ago, The Economist magazine they did an article about smart beta investments. And just to give you some numbers, um, by the, they, they did a survey of institutional investors. Three quarters were either using or evaluating this approach. And there's $534 billion of assets in smart beta ETFs. That doesn't include pension fund, managed accounts, or mutual funds. Just ETFs, $534 billion as of a few months ago. And the growth rate has been 30% compounded annually over the last five years in terms of assets under management. It's extraordinary. And so here's an example of what um, an, a, a smart beta offering looks like. This is from the uh, BlackRock um, website, uh, iShares uh, uh, Smart Beta. And you can actually you know, click on this little video that you'll hear the explanation of Smart Beta by Sarah Shores, the global head of Smart Beta. So this is a real thing. And the last slide I'm going to show you is, is this, which is from that same website. If you click on what Smart Beta means, it's multiple factors. What are those factors? Well, they're listed here. They've got economic growth, real rates, inflation, credit, and so on. It's pretty cool, right? You've got a wide range of factors. Let me show you the factors that were used in Chen, Roll, and Ross in 1986. This is from table one of Steve's paper. We've got inflation, treasury bills, long-term bonds, industrial production, equal evaluated indexes, consumption, oil prices, and various functions of it. Virtually all of the factors that are used in smart beta products today were in Chen, Roll, and Ross in 1986, over three decades ago. So uh, as I said, um, you know, academia uh, has this privilege that those who we've lost uh, are still with us because of the theories that they espouse. And uh, for those of us in empirical finance and for those practitioners that are involved in this, Steve is, is with us every day. Thank you, and thank you, Steve. Phil, Mark, uh, Andrew, thank you very much for wonderful talks. After a short break, we're going to continue. We'll have a panel on practical implications of Steve's work, and this is a very nice segue into that. Thank you.